This is Dr. Jack McGeechee, YouTube's addiction medicine physician. Welcome back to the channel. Can you cure addiction with a single infusion of medication? Proponents of ketamine claim that a single treatment or series of treatments can help people with substance use disorder. What is ketamine and how does it work? What are the risks? What does the science say? We're going to talk about all that today and more. Just a quick reminder to like and subscribe so I can get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year and get verified as a doctor on YouTube. The channel continues to grow and your support means so much. Thank you. Before we proceed, I need to remind you that nothing I speak about in today's video should be considered medical advice. If you have a question about addiction treatment which pertains to an individual situation, consult with a medical professional. With that out of the way, let's talk ketamine. Ketamine is a drug which was introduced to the U.S. market in 1970 as an anesthetic. When given intravenously, ketamine induces a rapid induction into sedation, but the patient continues breathing on their own. Ketamine is therefore a very useful drug for inducing general anesthesia for surgery and for providing sedation during minor but painful procedures. Unlike other anesthetics, ketamine doesn't cause the obliteration of consciousness, but rather induces a mental state known as dissociation. It's hard to explain the difference between unconsciousness and dissociation because from the outside these states look identical. Dissociated patients may be unresponsive but they actually perceive their surroundings. Dissociated patients are aware but their internal consciousness is divorced from their experiences of the outside world. This means that they experience pain and noxious stimuli but they do not perceive them as unpleasant and they do not remember what happened while they were dissociated. It's almost like the patient is in a waking dream. To put it in other words, you become a detached observer inside your body but separate from it, almost like dreaming. Patients uh, typically have no memory of the events during dissociation, which lasts from 10 to 15 minutes with a single dose of ketamine. After a person reaches dissociation, Taking more ketamine won't make them more dissociated, but simply prolong the experience. Dissociation is like a light switch. You either are or you aren't. Now that you understand the basics of ketamine dosing, let's learn how ketamine exerts its effects on the human brain. Ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist. This means that it acts to turn off the signaling of NMDA receptors on brain cells. These receptors detect glutamate, which is a signaling molecule in the brain, which leads to increased brain activity. When ketamine is administered, it blocks glutamate from binding the NMDA receptors and interrupts the pathways which transmit pain from the spinal cord and also those that help create our experience of consciousness. The net effect is to block pain and create a dissociated state. This explanation is a very simple one, as ketamine also has effects throughout the brain that we're still not fully aware of. It also appears that ketamine can improve the symptoms of depression, reduce the severity of chronic pain, and reverse opioid tolerance, at least for a brief period. Scientists are still not certain how ketamine produces these effects. In recent years, ketamine has gained popularity as a therapy for treatment-resistant depression and chronic pain. These effects were first observed in patients who were sedated with ketamine for electroconvulsive therapy and for pain treatment procedures. Doctors noticed that patients who received ketamine for sedation seem to have better results than those receiving other sedatives. Studies have since demonstrated a small but real benefit for patients with depression and chronic pain. However, this benefit is only temporary and therefore patients require regular repeat therapy sessions, typically once every few months. Ketamine is not approved by the FDA for the treatment of depression or chronic pain, but this does not necessarily mean that it is ineffective. Many drugs are used for conditions other than what the FDA indicates. To gain FDA approval would take years of expensive clinical trials, and there's little motivation for drug companies to pay for these because ketamine has been a generic drug for decades, and therefore no single company could profit from a new treatment indication. 
The lack of FDA approval for depression and chronic pain treatment has not stopped the numerous ketamine clinics which have opened in recent years in order to exploit the excitement of ketamine therapy. Naturally, if ketamine can help patients with treatment-resistant depression and chronic pain, doctors were curious if it might actually help people with substance use disorder as well. If we could help patients with a single infusion, it would be a tremendous boon. What does the science say about ketamine treatment for addiction? Unfortunately, the evidence for ketamine treatment of substance use disorder is sparse. As I mentioned previously, there's little motivation for drug companies to fund investigation into generic drugs that they cannot exclusively profit from. Therefore, all trials mentioned are funded by universities or public grants. Many were performed in a hospital setting. Most are short-term studies with no long-term follow-up. All involve small numbers of patients. I'm going to break this research down into alcohol, cocaine, and opioid use disorders. Beginning with cocaine use disorder. Two studies from the same research team, Dokwar et al., studied ketamine infusions in hospitalized patients with cocaine use disorder. These patients received a single infusion of intravenous ketamine. Afterwards, the researchers studied a number of outcomes to determine if ketamine had any effect on their cocaine cravings. The first study tested two different doses of ketamine and a control medication. The low-dose infusion was 0.41 mg a kg, and the high-dose infusion was 0.71 mg a kg. The control medication was midazolam, a benzodiazepine. This was a crossover study, meaning that the same patients all received both treatment doses and the control medication in a series of treatments. After the ketamine infusions, patients had improvements in their cocaine cravings when they were exposed to visual stimuli to use, but there was also no difference in efficacy between the two doses of ketamine. In the follow-up study, researchers compared the high-dose ketamine infusion to the midazolam control. This time, they measured efficacy by offering the patients a choice of $11 or 25 milligrams of pharmaceutical cocaine. As an aside, how did they get IRB approval to offer cocaine to hospital patients? My friend wants to know where to sign up. <laughs> patients were more likely to choose the cash over the cocaine after they got a ketamine infusion. Bottom line, ketamine seems to help cocaine cravings in the short term, but we don't know how long this effect lasts. More research is necessary. Moving on to alcohol. Again, we have two studies. One about long-term outcomes for people with alcohol use disorder, and one about treating alcohol withdrawal in the hospital. The first study by Krupitsky et al treated patients in a residential treatment program with a single ketamine psychotherapy session and followed their progress over a year. In this case, the patients not only received ketamine infusions, but also participated in a therapy session during the infusion, followed by ongoing treatment. The control group did not receive the ketamine therapy session and only participated in routine follow-up, but not therapy. At one year, the ketamine group had an abstinence rate of 65.8% compared to the 24% of the control group. However, the ketamine group received additional ongoing therapy sessions, which means we cannot attribute this benefit completely to the ketamine. The second study by Wang et al. asked if ketamine infusions can help patients with severe alcohol withdrawal by reducing the amount of benzodiazepines needed for treatment of their withdrawal. Currently, benzodiazepine drugs like Ativan, known as lorazepam, and Valium, known as diazepam, are the standard of care for severe alcohol withdrawal. These patients were experiencing very severe withdrawal, with 75% of them in delirium tremens at the time of the study. Delirium tremens is a condition caused by severe alcohol withdrawal, which manifest as psychosis and altered consciousness. In the study, there was a trend towards decreased need for benzodiazepine medications, but it was not statistically significant. 
which is a fancy way of saying that ketamine had no effect. Bottom line, ketamine may help patients stay sober long term, but it does not seem to help with alcohol withdrawal. The evidence overall is poor and we need more studies. Moving on to opioids, we have three studies this time, two pertaining to long-term outcomes in people with opioid use disorder, and one pertaining to the treatment of opioid withdrawal. The first two studies are also from Krupiski et al. <laughs> These guys really like ketamine. In the first, patients with heroin use disorder received either a single high-dose ketamine injection of 2 mg a kilogram, or a single low-dose injection of 0.2 mg a kilogram. The ketamine treatment was followed by therapy at regular intervals over two years. At one year after treatment, the high-dose ketamine treatment patients had an abstinence rate of 24%, compared to only 6% in the low-dose group. As a follow-up study, the researchers studied the effects of multiple ketamine treatment sessions compared to a single treatment session. They only administered the high dose of 2 mg a kg IM to all of the patients in this study. Patients who received multiple doses of ketamine had an abstinence rate of 50% at one year compared to 22% among the low dose treatment group. The third study on opioids, done by Jovesia et al., studied ketamine infusions for the treatment of opioid withdrawal in patients undergoing anesthesia assisted rapid opioid detoxification. If you aren't familiar with this procedure, see my video on the topic. The link should appear up here or here. They gave patients either an infusion of half a milligram a kilogram ketamine or saline while they were sedated and measured various levels of physiologic stress. Patients who received the ketamine had lower measurements of heart rate, blood pressure, and cortisol, which is a stress hormone, during their withdrawal. They also measured long-term outcomes for four months, but found no improvement in treatment retention, abstinence from opioids, physical health, or social functioning. Bottom line, ketamine may help patients who are already receiving treatment for their opioid use disorder, and it might help the immediate symptoms of physical withdrawal, but it should not be viewed as a cure to addiction in itself. So we talked about the science, but what about the risk of ketamine? Ketamine is a comparatively safe medication, but it does have risk. The side effects of ketamine include rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, nausea, vomiting, increased salivation. These minor effects are temporary in duration, and they can be addressed with other medications. The more significant risk of ketamine are respiratory depression and laryngospasm both of which are potentially lethal without immediate skilled medical intervention. Most patients receiving ketamine will continue breathing on their own, and they require no additional assistance aside from monitoring. A small number, however, will start to breathe slowly or stop breathing altogether. Without careful monitoring, this can be missed until it is too late, and the patient's heart stops beating, which is known as cardiac arrest. Laryngospasm describes a situation where the vocal cords start to contract involuntarily and this leads to obstruction of the airway. The cords clamp down and no air can pass into the lungs. Naturally, this condition is an emergency and requires skilled intervention to avoid cardiac arrest. The treatment for laryngospasm is to inject paralytic drugs, which break the spasm of the cords, and then insert a breathing tube to provide artificial respirations. Without the proper tools and skills, laryngospasm can create a scenario known as can't intubate, can't ventilate, which is something all doctors dread. It is a guaranteed death sentence for the patient without treatment. Such a scenario, in fact, is how Joan Rivers died while receiving anesthesia at an outpatient surgery center. The unpredictable nature of laryngospasm makes patient monitoring mandatory and requires that a professional skilled in airway management like an anesthesiologist be present at all times during ketamine administration. Thankfully, most ketamine clinics are run by anesthesiologists or other doctors knowledgeable in airway management. 
It's important to check the qualifications of the staff at the center before agreeing to any ketamine treatments. Ask who will be present during your treatment and what their qualifications are. You're looking for an anesthesiologist, nurse anesthetist, or emergency medicine trained person who will be physically present during the infusion. Also ask what monitoring is utilized. The gold standard is in tidal capnography, which displays a continuous waveform of the concentration of exhaled CO2 and can detect changes in respirations immediately. Finally, make sure the clinic has drugs and equipment available to respond to airway emergencies. They should have a crash cart or airway box which contains these tools. This is not something that you want to eyeball or leave to chance because seconds count in an airway emergency. I know that was a lot, so what's the take home message? Ketamine is a rising star of alternative treatment, not only for addiction, but also depression and chronic pain. Like mushrooms after the rain, a bounty of clinics offering various forms of ketamine therapy have opened in recent years. Despite the popularity of ketamine, the clinical evidence supporting its use is sparse, especially regarding addiction treatment. This does not necessarily mean that ketamine is ineffective, because there is often little evidence for the use of older drugs and off-label prescribing is the rule rather than the exception in medicine for this reason. That said, what evidence does exist suggests that ketamine alone is not a silver bullet for addiction. There is evidence that it can reduce the severity of opioid withdrawal and that it might also help with long-term recovery. It should be used in combination with ongoing therapy as ketamine treatment alone seems ineffective. Regarding alcohol use disorder, ketamine does not seem to reduce alcohol withdrawal symptoms, but it might improve long-term outcomes in conjunction with ongoing therapy, as is the case with opioid use disorder. When it comes to cocaine use, there's no evidence for long-term benefits, but it seems to reduce cravings in the short term. These results are promising, but more data are necessary. There are ongoing trials regarding this exact topic for opioid use disorder. I look forward to the results as we desperately need new treatment options. For now, I don't specifically advise my patients to seek out ketamine therapy. The cost is rather high and the benefits are uncertain. Since no insurance company reimburses for ketamine therapy, nearly all patients pay cash out of pocket. Clinics offering ketamine therapy market to people with disposable income and a single session can cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars. If the patient has a budget for their treatment, it's best to spend that money on proven addiction therapies first. If they have the money to burn or other treatments have failed, ketamine is an option to consider. However, at this time, I consider ketamine an ancillary treatment after standard medications, psychotherapy, and support groups. If you watched to the end of the video, I want to thank you for your support. I enjoy making these videos and I hope that you enjoy watching them. If you enjoyed today's video, click the like button. As I said before, I'm trying to reach 10,000 subscribers by the end of the year and you can help me by clicking subscribe. It helps the channel grow and it will help me get verified as a licensed doctor on YouTube. Finally, if you or someone you love is suffering from problematic drug or alcohol use and is interested in seeking help, visit my website, ntehealth.com. On the website, you can learn more about my clinic and contact us in order to schedule a free discovery call and initial evaluation. Till next we need, bye-bye.